Well, hello there, my friend. I'm Jay Connor, known as the Private Money Authority, and welcome to Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm excited today on the show to talk with you about a deal that I just put under contract last week. We're talking about Panther Trail in Havelock, North Carolina. And to help me talk about this deal, I have invited the executive producer of this podcast, Scott Patton, to join me here on the show and help pick my brain as to how in the world we found this deal and how we structured the deal and how the numbers are working and how we're going to make at least, if not more than $66,000 on this little ranch house right here in Eastern North Carolina. Hello there, Scott. Hey, Jay, how are you doing today? I'm doing great because we got another deal under contract without using my own money. And that's exciting. That must be a really nice feeling. You know, you look at your bank account, most people, when they buy something, the bank account goes down. You buy hundred thousand dollar pieces of property and your bank account stays the same and then goes up. Exactly. Because we've got multiple ways that we fund the deals. This particular deal, we didn't actually use private money as we were just talking about here on the book. I can use private money and I will use private money in addition to how I bought it. If I decide to rehab it, I love this kind of deal because we've got multiple exit strategies. So nice. yeah, I mean, there's so many lessons to be learned from this particular house that we just put under contract. So Jay, if you didn't use private money, you didn't use hard money and you didn't go to the bank, how did you buy the house? Yes. Yeah, so we bought this house. Well, it's under contract. So, um, you know, we haven't had the final stanza of the opera singer yet, but it's scheduled to close actually next Tuesday. There's a lesson right there. We put it under contract last week. It's already closing next week. That's less than two weeks of putting it under contract without using any kind of bank money. So how do we do it? So we bought, we got this house under contract using a strategy called buying subject to the existing note, buying subject to the existing note. So I'm sure many of you know what that means, but just in case you're listening on, you know, iTunes or Google play or whatever, and you don't, and you're not familiar, what subject to means there is a mortgage on the house. The people that are selling the house to us have got a mortgage. It's current. It's not behind doesn't matter. You can buy a house subject to the existing note, whether the payments are current or the payments are behind. But what it means is the seller is agreeing or has agreed to sell their house, transfer title, transfer the deed, transfer ownership into my, to my business. We're going to own the house and the seller has agreed to leave their mortgage in their name and I am agreeing to make their payments, their monthly mortgage payments to keep it current. And you know, when I first heard of this strategy, my first thought, Scott was who in their right mind would sell me their house and agree to give me total ownership. They're, these people are moving out of state. I mean, they're going, I'm in North Carolina. These people are moving down to Georgia. Wow. Who in their right mind would sell me their house? and not get their mortgage paid off. And I'm agreeing to make their payments. Well, the, the answer to that question, the person that will agree to do that is a motivated seller. And there's many, many, many different types of motivation. These particular people are just done. If they were to put the house in the multiple listing service, it needs money in order to get it to sell them. So, so they want to go, they don't want to go through the, unknown time frame of how long is it going to take to get the house sold, et cetera. So and now, I want everybody to the understand. Realtor, the realtors aren't really going to look at this house. Is that what you're saying? Correct. So we're buying it subject to the realtors have got nothing to do with this transaction. This is between them and between me and my team and, and my company. And I want everybody to understand that when you buy a house subject to the existing note, that is not assuming the mortgage. I'm not assuming the mortgage. If I were assuming the mortgage, 
the mortgage would be transferred into my name. The mortgage is not being transferred into my name. It's staying in the seller's name and the bank or the mortgage company or the lender has got nothing to do with this decision. They don't have to approve me. They don't have to approve you. This is between you and the seller. And guess what? It's line number 203 on the settlement statement. This is nothing that's like, you know, your real estate attorney has got to, got to go make up something on the paperwork. It's already a line on the HUD settlement statement. And the funding line says, purchased subject to the existing note. So that's how we have funded this deal. That's, that's pretty amazing. So you're, you're making the payments, you're not making any down payment and, right. and you don't really have a lot of risk. Correct. So, um, you know, we're doing, uh, my real estate attorney is handling the closing. So this is not like some kind of documentation that we do on somebody's kitchen table that all of our closings are handled by the real estate attorney. And um, so, yeah. And, and I mean, a lot of times when we buy a house subject to the existing notes, such as a foreclosure and people are behind on their payments, we have to bring those payments current. But in this case, they're current. And of nice. course, they are trusting me and my company to keep their payments current. They've got great credit. They tell us the payments are current and um, you know, they're trusting us to keep those, their payments current because you know, a year or two down the road, they're probably going or, you know, two or three or four years down the road, they might want to buy another house and this mortgage will need to be paid off before they buy another house, but that's not their primary concern right now. So basically what you're saying is you found this house, the people want to leave the state, the, the house is in a condition that, that, that a realtor will look at it and laugh and leave. Basically, they're not going to be able to put it on MLS to sell it. You come along and you say, you know what? I can fix up the house. I can, I'll make you an offer. And part of that offer that they agreed to was you're just going to take over the mortgage payments. So you don't have a big down payment to make. You've got whatever their mortgage payment is. They're able to say, oh, thank goodness. This house is off of my plate. What a relief that is. Now we can go. I think you said down to Georgia and live, live the life that we want to live or whatever yeah. it is they're doing down there. Well, you just said something, Scott, that triggered this. And that is when a seller of a house is motivated and their primary motivation is debt relief. You just said the house is, you know, off their shoulders, the mortgage is off their shoulders. It's still in their name but the responsibility of it, as far as what I've agreed to is off their shoulders. So a subject to seller is really looking for, uh, I just want to get this payment off of me so I can get on with my life. And that motivation, I mean, the, somebody, you know, something motivating somebody to do that could be divorce. It could be the loss of a significant other or spouse. It could be the loss of a job. I mean, on and on and on and on and on. Right. And so I can tell you, Scott, just from experience of doing this business since 2003 and rehabbing over 400 houses and, and doing all these deals, I guarantee you if I had wanted to, I could have asked these sellers to make the next three payments. If I agreed to start with the fourth payment, they would have done it. They would have moved on to Georgia knowing that all I got is three more payments and I'm done. But um, you know, enough is enough. When we go over the numbers here in a second on this house, I mean, my lands, I, I don't, I don't need to negotiate that even though I could have. Well, that, let's get into some of the numbers, Jay. Like how much did you buy the house? Yeah. So the purchase price is 99,000 and some change, but we might as well call it 99,000. Now the purchase price is how much they owe on the house. That's oh. the purchase price. That is the payoff. That's currently what they owe. And now how do we know exactly how much they owe when I buy it subject to here's how we have the seller of the house contact their mortgage company or their current lender and ask for what's called a 30 day payoff instruction letter, a 30 day payoff instruction letter. So we don't just look at their most recent mortgage statement either that came in the mail or it's online. That's not what's owed on the house. There's some other ancillary fees. So I want to know exactly what's owed on the house. 
Now these people, when we ask the question, would you be willing to sell what you owe? Or would you be able, would you be able to sell it? Would you be willing to sell it for what you owe? That's the payoff. Their answer was yes to that question. We'll sell it for what we owe. By the way, we never talk subject to over the phone. We don't talk about that until after we've been to the house, right? That's beside the point for now. So the purchase price is, is $99,000 and that is how much they owe on the house. That's how much they owe on the mortgage. So they just want to walk away from this and not have it be any more of a problem than it already is. Just be done. And they've owned the house for about five years and they've put their own money in it. I mean, they, there's, beautiful stainless steel appliances that they put in like a year and a half ago. There's beautiful new countertops that they put in new flooring that they put in, in some areas of the house. So, um, so we're not talking about a shack. We're talking no, about a nice home. This is, this is what we call a pretty house. So, you know, as I said, we've got multiple exit strategies to consider here. Um, but the first thing I want to do is just close on it next week. And then I'll decide what I want to do, but we'll talk about the, the different, there's two it's main nice to have more than more than one option for, for exiting. Yes. So how much, if you decide, cause normally what you do is you buy the house, you fix it up, you sell the house. Uh, so I'm assuming that's the first strategy we're going to talk about uh, to fix it up. You said it's 99,000. It's probably going to be what 40 or 50,000 to fix it up and get it presentable. Well, that's a wonderful thing about this home. So this is what we call a pretty house versus an ugly house. A pretty house definition is it's habitable, needs, needs some TLC, but nothing major, you know, I mean, it doesn't need like, it doesn't need a, it doesn't need a new roof. However, it does need some minor roof repair on the front right corner, but the roof is fine. Doesn't need, doesn't need a new HVAC, right? but it needs lipstick. So if I rehab this house all the way and make it drop dead gorgeous, ready for Southern living magazine pictures and all that, <laughs> and for a, you know, for the realtor to hire the professional videographer and come in and do a 3d uh, right. tour walk tour and all that. So it take $15,000 estimated rehab to make it just, just absolutely gorgeous. If, if I want to put it in the multiple listing service and get top dollar today. So your, your bottom line cost or the money you're going to be putting out over time and right away is around $414,000. If I choose to rehab it. Right. So if you choose to rehab it, uh, what would you sell it for? Yeah. So the after repaired value is $180,000 today. And that's what my realtor just told me last week as we were touring the house right before we went under contract. So the after repaired value, of course, the definition of after repaired value is everything. It looks like a brand new home, smells like a brand new home, all that. Yeah. So after repaired value, 180,000. If I rehab it at 15,000 purchase of 99, so the anticipated profit, putting it in the multiple listing service, listing it with a realtor is $66,000 profit. Flip, yeah, that's the flip profit. Right. 66,000. And you know what? My average profit per sink, I mean, this house has got 1,450 square feet, three bed, two bath, you oh, know. Beautiful. You know, it's just your, just your average, you know, size house. By the way, Scott, I didn't even, tell you or tell everybody, how did in the world did we find this house? Well, we found this one with a Google ad. Google oh, ad. Wow. So, so what's so beautiful about Google ads versus Facebook ads, and I do both. I do Facebook ads, I do Google ads. A Facebook ad, it comes up in your newsfeed and you weren't looking for it, right? It just, there, there you are on the newsfeed. A Google ad, this is a writer downer folks. This is a writer downer right here. When you get a response from a Google ad, then people were looking for you. Yes. They went into Google and they typed in sell my house fast or something like that. And guess what? There you there come you up. Are. There you are in your Google ads. Like you were looking for me. Here I am. I'm going to fix your problem. So a Google ad uh, prospect 
it has got typically more, much more motivation than a Facebook ad respondent. Neat. So you had talked about two exit strategies. We already talked about one where you basically buy the house, fix it up, put it, give it to your realtor, Chris, and he goes, puts it on the MLS and he does a great job of selling it. But there's a second exit strategy that got you kind of excited. What was that? So we sell a lot of homes on rent to own, same thing as lease purchase. So let's talk about these two different exit strategies. And quite frankly, I haven't decided which way I'm going to go. Um, it doesn't matter really. I mean, it's both of them are wins, but let's just, let's just play out the numbers. So I'll sell it on a rent to own. Now let, let me describe what rent to own means. Lease purchase is the same thing. So a rent to own buyer typically does not have the credit score to qualify for a mortgage, but they can afford a monthly payment and they got to have a deposit or a the actual legal term is called an option fee. We also call it a non-refundable lease option deposit. So the reason a rent to own buyer will buy from you. So if I sell it to on rent to own, I'm selling it as is. It's also called in this case, work for equity, right? But we're selling it as is. So in other words, if I sell a rent to own, I'm not going to put $15,000. I'm not going to put $15,000 rehab in this house. Because guess what? They're going to paint the walls themselves. All it needs is lipstick, this and that, right? Um, so I'm going to sell it at the same price of 180,000. But let me just get you in the, in the mind of the rent to own buyer. Okay. The rent to own buyer right now, there's 82% of Americans that cannot go to the local bank or a mortgage company and get a mortgage. Only 18% of the people can. So there's a lot of those people in the 82% category that don't qualify for a mortgage that would love to own a home. So when we sell it on rent to own, we're giving them the opportunity to look forward to having that home's deed transferred into their name when they are ready for a mortgage. Typically I'm not going to accept less than 5,000 or $10,000 in this case, 5% to 10%, typically no less than 5% of the rent to own selling price. The difference between selling it in the multiple listing service and selling it on rent to own is if I sell it on rent to own, I'll make more money, but I got to wait to get my money. I can make a little bit less money and get my money today. So Scott, let's run the numbers here. I'm going to sell it for the same price. You say, wait a minute, Jay, why would a rent to own buyer? pay the same price today as a multiple listing buyer that's ready for a mortgage. And here's why. Number one, their primary motivation is not price. Number two, and this is very, very important. Don't miss this folks. If I set, I always set the price typically at about 10% or so five to 10% above what the home is worth today. So the home is not worth $180,000 today in its current condition. It's worth $180,000 if I put 15,000 in it, right? So the home is worth right now, let's say as is $165,000, but I'm not going to sell it to the rent to own buyer for what it's worth today. And here's why, besides their primary motivation, not being price. If I'm going to give them one year or two years, to get ready for a mortgage. Well, my lands just in the past year, prices have gone up 20% in this area. Wow. If I set the price at today's as is value of 165,000 and it goes up 20%, which would be about $13,000 within a year or two, I just threw $13,000 out the window. Right? Yeah. So that's why I'm setting the price at 5% to 10% above what it's worth today. So in a way they're not buying the house today or closing next week. They're actually buying the house in a year or two years down the road. Correct. Correct. 
Now, the beautiful thing about a rent to own buyer relationship to me, the real estate investor that is selling, we don't have a traditional landlord tenant relationship. Right. What I mean by that is the first 30 days when they move in, I'm responsible for all the repairs of anything that's not working as it's intended. I want all the major components to be working. I don't want anything leaking, right? I just want them to be responsible for the TLC, the tender loving care, the lipstick, et cetera. So after 30 days, the rent to own buyer are, is responsible for all the repairs. So they have got the mindset of being a homeowner. Another great advantage is I don't care if they got pets, they got pets, they can move in. So the, the rent to own buyer has got the mindset of I am a owner. I just don't have the title or the deed transferred into my name yet. And this is a pathway to where I can actually be a homeowner. Whereas otherwise I'd be renting, you know, maybe the rest of my life. So this rent to own exit strategy is just a beautiful win-win for everybody. So Scott, back to the numbers, I'm going to set the price still at $180,000 selling price. Same thing as selling today, but guess what? Guess what? I'm not going to put $15,000 in rehab. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not, they're, they're going to, Hey, this house, one room's got purple walls. Another room's got orange walls. You say, Jay, how can you sell a house with purple walls and orange walls? Rent to own buyer. They're going to paint it the color they want anyway. That would normally be a mistake that a lot of people make too, is that you, let's say you go and you paint everything and then the next, the rent to own buyer comes in and they don't like the colors and they want, they're going to repaint it. So they're going to repaint it anyway. Cause you're not talking to people that are poor necessarily. They're just people that can't afford a mortgage. And I think that's a huge distinction because a year ago, if you, if you could get a mortgage, if there was a hundred people who a year ago could get a mortgage, 30% of them cannot today, even if nothing has changed in their finances, the banks have just changed the rules and the criteria. And you had a great stat about like 82% or whatever it was, can't afford it anyway. It's gone up because the banks have sort of tightened the screws a little bit. And so we have a lot of people who have no problem making the down payment. They have no problem paying the rent. They have a problem with the bank, just like you had the problem with the bank, you know, a long time ago. And this is a, so a solution for their problem. Exactly. So the profit here, let's run the numbers here on the rent to own. So the profit is 180,000 still when they're ready for a mortgage. Of all I've got in it is 99. So the profit in the future on this, exit strategy is $81,000 versus 66,000 a day, but I got to wait. But there's one thing on this profit that we haven't calculated, Scott, yeah. or take into account. Selling on rent to own, I got a positive cash flow. So this subject to mortgage, the monthly mortgage payment is right around 700 a month. The rent to own buyer is going to be paying 1200 a month. So I'm going to get a $500 a month, positive cash flow. If I sell on rent to own, I got that five or 10% non-refundable lease option deposit. Now when they get ready for a mortgage, if they get ready for a mortgage, okay, I'm going to apply that five or 10,000 or whatever it is, non-refundable lease option deposit to their purchase price. But guess what? Let's say they don't get ready for a mortgage. Let's say they move out. Guess what? I still own the house. They don't get their non-refundable lease option deposit back. And I get to sell the house again. Now I will tell you my mindset and my outlook with uh, having a servant's heart is the way I look at this world and people. I want these people to get a mortgage. Actually, I'm going to help them. I'm going to refer them to my credit repair company, help them get there. But if they right. decide otherwise, the responsibilities on them is whether they stay or, the, or they move out. So again, multiple, multiple exit strategies. That's another thing, Scott, we didn't bring out. And I see we're about running out of time, so I probably need to wrap up. But one thing we didn't bring out is let's come back over to the rehab. How am I going to fund the rehab if I decide to rehab for 15,000 and put it in the multiple listing service? Well, 
Here's how I'm going to fund it. Private money. Private hey. money. I'm not, I'm not going to get that $15,000 out of my pocket, right? I'm going to use private money so I can get a small, I, you know, I could borrow 20,000, 25,000, whatever dollars from a private lender and give them a promissory note and a mortgage in second position underneath the first mortgage. So right. now I've got the first mortgage payment that I'm agreeing to pay. Now I can just borrow, shoot, if I borrowed, if I borrowed $25,000, use 15,000 of it to rehab it, I can stick the other $10,000 in my pocket. So if I borrowed 25, I bought it for 99, call it 125 when I sell it for 80, I still got a $55,000 positive cash flow and I put $10,000 in the bank. Ain't it a great business? It is. That's amazing. So again, fix it up, fix it up, sell it now. Uh, $66,000 profit. Of course, that's less realtor fees. See, when you sell on rent to own, there are no realtor fees. That's another benefit to selling on rent to own. You're going to save five or 6% because you found the buyer, rent to own buyer gets ready for a mortgage, 5% savings at least. That's going to save you $9,000 in realtor fees if you sell on rent to own. Again, you want more money. You want, you want nice money now, or you want even a bunch more money later. You, right. get to choose. you get to choose. So you can have a nice little check at the beginning. Then you can have a nice little uh, check every month come in <clears throat> and then you'll get a nice size check when they decide to, to, uh, to, well, when the bank says they're going to be able to afford a mortgage, but what would happen if they're okay. So they've got a good job. Let's say it's a family. Both of them are working. They've got a good job. Everything is fine. <clears throat> they're having a bit of trouble with their credit. Uh, and they decided to go for say two or three years instead of the one year. Is that an issue? Yes. Yeah, so um, that's an excellent question. Most of the time, my rent to own buyers, um, the rental agreement is for one year, 12 months, right? So I'm giving them 12 months to get ready for a mortgage. If they use the credit repair company that we refer them to, then they can, they will probably be ready for a mortgage, but I want to work with people, right? So from a legal standpoint, if they're not ready for that mortgage in one year on that term, I could kick them out. I mean, I could, you know, they lose their non-refundable lease option deposit. I go sell it again, but you know what? I don't do that. I want to work with people. If they've been making their payments on time and they're making progress and I've got a nice cash flow coming in, why in the world would I want to keep kick them out? I want right. to keep, I want to keep working with them. Right to help them move towards the mortgage. So in answer to the question, if they're not ready for a mortgage within the term of the agreement, what do I do? I extend, I extend their rental period if they have kept their end of the bargain. Now, the other side of it is they're motivated to fix their credit because you just said that it was $700 is what the mortgage is now and they're paying 1200. So, if I've got any financial savvy at all, I know that I could be saving that, let's say $400. Maybe it's a little bit more expensive mortgage than the people that are there now. Uh, so, you know, I could be looking at saying I'm giving away $400 that I could be putting in my pocket, $5,000 a year. And so I'm motivated to be able to switch over to this as yeah. soon as possible. Yeah. At interest rates today in the twos, <laughs> Um, that $1,200 a month rental payment would come down uh, and help their cash flow per month when they are ready for a mortgage. That's for sure. Nice. Awesome. So that's a pretty nice deal that you've got going there and you're helping a, two groups of people. Obviously the people there want to leave and another family is going to want a nice place in, in uh, North Carolina. Yeah. I mean, it's a win-win all around. I mean, the, these people, the sellers, they want out of Dodge. They want to get back. They've lived down in this town in Georgia. They want to get back to this town in Georgia. They don't like where they are here. <laughs> they want to get, they got, you know, family down there in Georgia and that's a win for them. I mean, we're able to make it happen fast. I mean, you know, we're closing in within two weeks. That never happens through traditional. And guess what? 
Another advantage of buying subject to or using private money, there's no appraisal involved. There's, right. there's all this time entanglements that they, I mean, the beautiful thing about either buying subject to or and or using private money is we get to set the rules. The banks don't set the rules. We set the rules. So um, yeah, I mean, this is just a great example of the deals that we do uh, every month, month in and month out. So let me just quickly go through a summary for everybody. So you purchased the place for 99,000. You bought it subject to the existing note. The after repaired value is 180. The rehab is going to be around $15,000 by private money. So all in your cost is 114,000, which if you just put it on MLS and you sold it would be a profit of 66,000 less lawyer, lawyer fees, uh, realtor fees, that sort of thing. However, we have two exit strategies. And the second one is sell on rent to own. So you're still going to sell it at the same price. Uh, and it's going to be around $1,200 a month on rent to own and a non-refundable lease option of between five and $10,000, which means that probably in the neighborhood of $81,000 profit, you're helping somebody who doesn't uh, can't get a mortgage right now, but they're going to be able to have that feeling of home ownership and move towards it and fix their repair. And it gives you a monthly positive cash flow of $500. So you're going to get some money right away, a nice chunk, five, 10 grand. You're going to get this cash flow going through for the next year or so. And then at the end of it, they're going to get a mortgage and you're going to get the rest of the money. That's it. That's it. Sounds like a great deal. It is Scott. It is Scott. Scott, I'm so glad you joined me here. Uh, folks again, Scott Patton, the executive producer of real estate investing with Jay Connor. And I tell you what, it's a lot more fun to talk with somebody than be a talking head. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it sure is. So Jay, if somebody wanted to uh, learn more about what it is that you do, how can they, what steps should they take? Well, it's real easy, folks. Get right on over to www.jayconner, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash book. And uh, I go I go through all the steps, easy steps on exactly how you can get as much private money as I do to fund your deals. Thank you so much for joining. And look, I really appreciate the reviews. Uh, if you're, you know, subscribe on YouTube, be sure and subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any of the future uh, trainings that we do right here. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and uh, join us again. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And here is to taking your business to the next level. We'll see you on the next Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor.